Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold, and it is time for Guy Talk, or Guys Who Talk. Here's how that works. You uh, send in the questions, and they do their very best to answer them. The number to send your questions via text is 877-933-2484. I bet you got a question you've wanted to ask. Maybe you've wanted to ask your pastor and you thought, mm, no, he's really busy. So I, you don't get the question answered. So send it to us and we'll do our very best. Again, 877-933-2484. The panel is here in place, ready to go. I've got Dr. Greg Borgond, Pastor Tom Parrish, and Jeff Verdorn. <laughs> We were taking bets today as to how long I could last uh, on the pause. Under. The under got it. The under got it? The under got it. Okay. All right. I felt anxious. Uh, yes, you were. Yeah, Wyatt said, don't go too long. We'll get kicked <laughs> off the air. I'm glad we got through that. We're okay. We're still on. All right. All right. So, again, 877-933-2484. Yeah, let me get my first question started. This came from Esther, and she said, First John 5, verses 16 and 17, puzzles me. I've compared multiple versions and I'm still unclear about the sin that leads to death and the sin that does not lead to death. And why should we not pray for those who commit the sin that leads to death? What is it? Well, I'll start here today. Um, We know that when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, Scripture declares that you have received forgiveness, you are saved, you are made a child of God, you're redeemed, justified, made righteous, all of those things that happen at the moment of salvation. So I think what John is saying here is that uh, the sin that leads to death is the sin of unbelief. Yeah. It's the sin that uh, when um, elsewhere in Scripture it talks about the if you commit blasphemy of the Holy Spirit— uh, which is uh, rejecting the Spirit's call, who convicts the world of sin and righteousness of judgment. And if you reject that call, you're rejecting the call of God unto salvation. So once again, the unpardonable sin or the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is again remaining in unbelief. Because, for example, John 3 makes it very clear. If you believe, then you are saved. And if you don't believe, you stand condemned already. And and it goes right up to the moment that God calls you home. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fact of the matter is, (laughs) I already did it again, Um, is, (laughs) is that you can have unbelief all through your life and at the very last moment receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So you do not commit the unpardonable or unforgivable sin. But if you, and, and only God knows this, when you cross the line that there is no return for you. That can happen before you die, but only God knows that. So it's, it's I agree with you, Jeff, it's, it's unbelief. And I've been with people right up to the moment of death who were unbelievers and literally broke down in tears and repented on their, their deathbed, Beautiful. received Jesus, and went into the kingdom of God. I think, though, that one thing, Paul says it, to help me, guys, what does he talk about? You know, some of you are being baptized for the dead. There's a scripture passage that talks about that. I think there were some real false beliefs in Christianity that were going on that somehow for those that have died, you can be baptized. Well, I'm thinking maybe this has a similar concept that you're now praying for somebody that's already died, that they'd be saved. And I have people ask me that all the time. Can I pray for my mom who didn't believe and now she's dead? And basically my answer is no, mm-hmm. <laughs> it doesn't work that way because all sins are forgiven by faith in Jesus. But if you come to your death and breathe your last breath and die, then I can't pray anybody out of, you know, that situation. They've created that. So it's a complex issue. I agree with exactly what you're saying. My attitude is be right right now. Yeah. Get right with Jesus this hmm. moment. 
Yeah, so, about praying, by the way, I think the... Uh, let, let me walk through this, see if you guys uh, see what you think on this. If you see any brother that sins that does not lead to death, you should pray about that, that God will give them life or restore them or whatever. And he says, I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. So the question was about the sin that does not lead to death or the sin that does lead to death. And then he goes on to say, I'm not saying that you should pray about that. I think he's just making a distinction between this is what I'm talking about when a brother sins. There's other sins that leads to condemnation or unbelief or the law, you know, not being saved. It, John is not saying that you shouldn't not pray for those who are lost here. Right. I think he's just pointing out that I'm talking about a brother who sins at the, that was at the start of that passage. Does that make sense? Yeah. He's yep. not saying don't pray for those who aren't saved. That's all you have left. For those who are not saved, pray that God will come into their life and bring you know circumstances into their lives that they might see and believe. You preach to them. You reason with them from the scriptures. You give an account for the hope that you have. I don't think he would ever say don't pray for those who are lost. And scripture is very clear. It is appointed for man to die once, and after that is judgment. So praying for somebody who has passed is not scriptural. Correct. That's a different issue, I think the listener has asked a wonderful question, because there are certain passages that leave everybody wondering a little bit. And I think that what we're trying to do is we're we're talking about, you know, not repenting before you die or something like that, or a sin like that. But the point is... Pray for your lost ones, even up to the moment they breathe their last breath. Witness to your lost ones right up at that last moment, and let the Lord deal with it one way or the other. Our job is to give invitations and opportunities to the living. One scholar puts it this way. He says, the sin that leads to death is probably the sin that is, number one, unrepented, number two, of the kind of nature that John has warned about throughout the letter, resolute rejection of the true doctrine about Christ, chronic disobedience to God's commandments, persistent lack of love for fellow believers, all indications of a lack of saving faith, which will not be forgiven. Hmm. Well done, gentlemen. I've got Greg B., Tom P., and Jeff V. Here to answer your questions, 877-933-2484. Guy talk or guys who talk. Do you guys feel bold and courageous today? That's my first question. Well, oh, that's Greg, a leading question. I'm that's a leading question. You got to wait for the hook that's coming. Oh, there's a there's a hook coming. I'm just <laughs> wanting to see if you guys feel courageous today. We, we are willing to jump in and make mistakes because we know we're redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Oh. So go ahead. <laughs> All right, school boys. Then explain Ephesians five twenty two to twenty six. Biblical obedience and biblical love. That is the question. You know what that's referring to in Ephesians. Chapter 5. Yep. So this is the wives submit it to is. your husbands. Um, you have to take the whole context here. So let's start with the husbands, shall we? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So what are husbands supposed to do? They're supposed to give themselves up for their wives, just as Christ gave himself up for the church. Then it says, wives... Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. It actually sounds kind of similar, doesn't it? It sure does. You give yourself up to your spouse. Now, I understand that the world has corrupted this word submit because there are religious systems in the world that basically make women into, you know, almost property, that the husband is completely and utterly dominant over the spouse. That is not what it's talking about here. Let me paint a different picture. Christ submitted to God perfectly during his earthly ministry. Now, is that a negative thing? No. No, it's not a negative thing. Beautiful thing. And in fact, this whole passage in verse 21 starts with this. Submit to one another then as to the Lord. So I think this mutual submission... Now, I'm not speaking of the the lack of authority of a husband over a wife, because I do think the head of the family is the husband, just as the head of the church is Christ. But there is a mutual submission there that I think is a beautiful thing, but the world has corrupted it. A quick story. I was speaking to a large group of men in, in Belfast, in Odyssey Arena, Belfast, Ireland. And I stood in front of them and I challenged them. I said, I want you for the next three weeks to outserve your wife hmm. and expect nothing in return. The first thing that will happen is she'll probably wonder what you're apologizing for. <laughs> but 
if you continue to do that as an act of worship to God, outserve your wife. And I think that relates to verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Love there means unconditional regard for the well-being and welfare of your wife. So outserving your wife and expecting nothing in return is an example of how that's done, in my view. I think what you're saying is exactly right. And I think what we forget is this. When the Lord inspired Paul to write these words, this was revolutionary for women, Mm. that they would even use this kind of language because women were property. Women are still property in many places of the world. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, I I have a, I mean, think about this for a moment. If suddenly the husband started treating the wife like an equal, an equal heir to the kingdom of God, an equal in all of this, I think most wives would be very happy to work along with her husband. And and if you want to use the word submit, which I know drives some women nuts to hear that, but it's a good word in the sense that you're now on an equal basis. Now, the husband is the head, as the Bible says, but in Christ, you know, they're neither male nor female. They are together one in serving the Lord. It's pretty revolutionary stuff. And I wish most marriages would operate that way today. I've done too much marital counseling over these years. And I will tell you right now that there is usually somebody in the marriage vying for authority over the other person and demanding they do what that what they want. In Christian marriage, if we've got a difference, we go to the Lord in prayer together. We submit to one another out of reverence for Jesus because he is the head of the body, the church. And to see a husband and wife love each other that much has just absolutely blown me away when I've seen it. And I don't see enough of that. I think this is God's design when you see children are to submit or obey their parents, wives submit to the husbands. Um, you have citizens submitting to the authorities that are over them, and they are then to submit to God. Uh, by the way, the husband is then to submit to God. And within the church, the, the, the sheep are to submit to the shepherd, and the shepherd or the elders are then are to submit to God. I mean, th- this model, this design— Uh, is given. God has set a structure in place. And this is not an authoritative structure, uh, but it's, it's, I think it's easy for us to conclude that God's design for the family is the best design. It is. And that is a husband and a wife and children as a, a unit that completely submit to the Lord. One last thing, there's, I think wives tend to look at the verse about the husbands and say, oh, he needs to do that. And husbands tend to look at the verse about the wives and say, she needs to do that. And can I just recommend that we all just stick to our, you know, in our own lane, guys, (laughs) read the verse about the husbands and wives, read the verse about the wives. You're going to have a very good life. (laughs) (laughs) Well, here's another question that came in that feels like it's in the same department, and that is... uh, Please describe, to the best of your ability, what a contentious woman is. Or maybe part two of the question is, what does the Bible say about a contentious or quarrelsome woman? Tom Parrish, I'm looking at you. Uh, What we're looking at here, whether it's a woman or a man, but we're talking about a woman here. Mm -hmm. A contentious woman. A contentious woman is somebody who basically always needs to be right always have the final word, and to nom- dominate other people. I know people like this, both male and female. It is disturbing to see this because when they walk into a room, the room gets quiet. People feel their presence, and it's not good. There are in families contentious parents, contentious husbands or wives, contentious kids. And all it does is create chaos. It doesn't create harmony. And so this kind of a person is not somebody you really want to be around or really enjoy being around. And they are hard people to deal with because even direct confrontation uh, doesn't always work well. Here's the definition of contentious, to be contentious, likely to cause disagreement or argument. Here's another definition, exhibiting an often perverse and wearisome tendency to quarrels and disputes. Mm -hmm. So it's a tendency. It's not a one-time occurrence. It's a pattern. So Proverbs 27, I'm going to read verse 15 and 16, says this, A quarrelsome wife is like the dripping of a leaky roof in a rainstorm. Restraining her is like restraining the wind or grasping oil with the hand. Um, 
So I don't, uh, th- there's one definition for you, right, from Scripture, right? Um, it's hard to define a quarrelsome woman, but when you meet one, it's pretty obviously, uh, pretty obvious when you do, right? I guess is is probably the answer. I feel like this, uh, this is a very lucky time to take a break right now. <laughs> My timing is perfect, so we're going to take a break. If you have a question for the panel, please send it over. The text line is 877-933-2484. Again, 877-933-2484. We're looking for your questions, so send them over. We carry each other's burdens. Please know you can bring us your prayer concerns, and we will pray. Share your prayer requests with the Faith Radio team by texting or calling 877-933-2484. Or share your prayer requests with the Faith Radio staff and listeners at MyFaithRadio.com. All right, welcome to Guide Talker, guys who talk. I'll connect the dots here for you because we have a professor, a pastor, and a Sunday school teacher. Just to connect these dots, Greg B. is the professor, Tom P. is the pastor, and Jeff V. is the Sunday school teacher. All right, that's good. (laughs) All right. Here's my next question, gentlemen. Let's see here. Um, Would or could it have been possible for Judas to repent after betraying Christ? Good question. We know Scripture declares that Judas was not saved. So let's establish that. Uh, There's a passage, and I can't remember where exactly where it is, but it says... Something like he he went to the place where he was destined to go, or mm-hmm. or something. I can't, I can't remember exactly where that verse is, but um, so scripture declares that number one. Number two, like we were talking about earlier at the top of the hour, um, it's a pan- appointed for man once to die and face judgment. Anybody can receive Christ right up until the moment that they pass into this into the next life. Uh, so it's always available. So is it possible? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, it's possible that. Hitler and his bunker could have accepted Christ and be saved. Now, it, it it didn't happen. I'm confident because of his life before that was just you know completely anti Christ in everything he did. But God offers salvation to everyone. Remember, He is the God that wishes none to perish, but all to come to repentance. Ezekiel thirty three eleven six says that He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. A life of disobedience is like running down a hill that sooner or later your momentum overtakes you and there's nothing you can do to turn around oh, good and, and, and climb back up that hill because you've just gotten too far down and the momentum has overtaken you. But even in that case, God could intervene, sure. even though it's impossible for that person <clears throat> to p- potentially repent God can intervene and convict them. I, I, you know, I go back to John sixteen eight over and over again. That the Holy Spirit's job is to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, no matter where you are on that sliding, sloping hill. Well, and the sad part is we know that Judas was regretful for what he did, and he, he literally threw back the 30 pieces of silver. The problem is he didn't understand or look to Jesus as the one that would cleanse him. The burden was on him. And his solution to that burden was to take his own life. And that was the mistake. And I think that's the mistake I see over and over in people. They get in deeply, like you're saying, going downhill. They figure there's no way out. The devil has convinced them they're worthless. This isn't going to, they're not going to get out of this. And they they just don't call upon the name of Jesus. And that's why I think it's so important that as other Christians, when we see somebody in that dilemma, a marriage, a husband, a wife, others, we got to keep referring to those, referring those people back to Jesus and saying there is always hope. You can always be, re, you know, restored. You can always be repentant. But too many forget that. Can so, I read that X verse? I found the verse I was referring to. It's X one verse twenty five. It's talking about Judas being replaced, by the way, as an apostle, and it it says to take over this apostolic ministry where Jesus left to go where he belongs. Yeah. Comment was made about a demon also influenced Judas. Yeah, I think it specifically says in Scripture, didn't it, doesn't it say Satan entered him? Yes. yes. So yeah, yeah, I mean there was a demonic influence, and um, uh, yeah, so he was in, influenced by demonic forces, satanic forces, and uh, he he rejected he, he rebelled against the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, someone who loves 
Christ, believes in him, is never going to reject him and, and turn him in and betray him, as Jesus, uh, as is described in Scripture. And just because he threw the 30 pieces of silver back may have more to do with understanding the consequences of an action. I mean, I, you know, there are people that, that make terrible decisions and want to change the yeah. consequences. And so if they steal money, like, for instance, from their business, they'll want to give it back because they don't want the consequences. But there's no repentance. No. They were caught. They're dealing with the consequences, and they want to alleviate those consequences. Martin Luther made a very good point, and I love his illustration. He said the Christian is like a horse. There's always somebody sitting in your saddle. It's either Jesus or the devil. Right. Hmm. So who are you going to let guide your life? And we all make those errors. We all sin. We will all admit that. But the key is, the moment you realize what you've done, return to Jesus and repent, and he will forgive you. We're faced over and over again with the decision to either embrace the cross or embrace the crowd. If we embrace the crowd, the way is wide. If we embrace the cross, it's narrow. But we're faced with that decision regularly. We may not use those terms to describe it, but that's what it is. Just like you're saying, Tom, about who's in the saddle. I mean, it's either the cross, it's either Christ and his finished work, or it's the crowd. Great point, Craig B. You think of Jesus feeding, and thousands and thousands show up for food, right? And then healing, thousands show up to be healed. Uh, teaching, hundreds and hundreds show up for teaching. Um, then it gets down to who will stay awake and pray with me? <laughs> no one. And he goes to the cross. And it's his mom. Yeah. 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 And John. Yep. Yep. Yeah, they struck the shepherd and the sheep scattered. No, no. You know, it was an Old Testament prophecy of that precise story. They they fled. They were in fear. You know, Peter, by the fire, was scared when a servant girl says, weren't you with him? I know. Just a servant girl, too, right? It's a servant girl. I know. No, no, not me. You got me mistaken. It was somebody else. I mean... You can't fathom. I, I don't want to be too hard on the disciples because this is life and death stuff, right? Absolutely. They were yeah. rebelling. The authority had captured their their rabbi, their teacher, their leader, and had just crucified them. And their expectation was that I'm next, right? So mm-hmm. I don't want to be too hard on them. And remember, even though Peter did that, he was not yet filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, after Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes. Do you think that Peter would have said the same thing to that servant girl? No way. The, the Peter that wrote First and Second Peter would have said, I, I, he's my Lord and my Savior and my God. The Lord taught me a lesson about this many years ago. My wife is pregnant for her first child. We're in Columbus, Ohio. Um, he weighed nine pounds, four ounces when he was born, and Jen's only 4'11". So, I mean, this was a big boy. We go into the emergency or go in for delivery because she's in labor pains. And as we're there, the doctor and the nurse come in and the doctor says, oh, my, we have a real problem here. This baby is breech. We're going to have to do surgery now. You know, and he went out of the room and the nurse, you know, said, just wait, we'll be right back. And she leaves. And I look at Jan and she looks at me and I, I don't know why the Lord led me to do this. We laid hands on her tummy and I said, Lord, turn this baby. And the baby flipped. And all of a sudden, his head was coming out, and I'm screaming, and the nurse comes in trying to calm me down, and then she starts screaming, he's coming out! And he was, he was born just a minute or two later. The point I'm driving at is this. What I discovered is that if my focus was on just the doctor or just the dilemma or just that, I was in trouble. The Lord taught me to focus on him, and I don't know why, honestly, guys, I went to prayer, but I felt led to do that. And I, I, to this day, I can remember feeling that baby, our son, Matt, wow. flip underneath my hand. And it taught me, that's where you need to look, but we need to encourage each other to do that. Wow. Great story, Tom P. All right, here's a question. Please explain leaving and cleaving when getting married, but also how to have a healthy relationship with your in-laws and family, helping each other, et cetera. Uh, in-laws is above the pay grade of the guy talk <laughs> panel <laughs> dealing with in-laws. No, my, uh, um, my wife's mother is still alive. Her father passed away, but, uh, it's just a wonderful woman and I get along with her wonderfully. So, okay. Um, let's, let's explain leaving and cleaving. 
when getting married? That's f- the first part yes. of the question. But Scrip- thank you, Jeff. A man should leave uh, his parents and cleave to his wife. Um, he's he's making a new family unit. Uh, this is kind of this uh, this idea. Wasn't there a movie one a while back, Failure to Launch or something? It's the the child needs to grow up. You need to train them up in the ways of the Lord. Bring them up in training and instruction of the Lord, as Ephesians says. And then, as they start their new, their own family unit, unit, they are to leave their previous parents and to cleave to their new spouse. Well, their priority then is their wife. Dep- Correct. Even if there's a contentious, we used that word earlier, relationship with the in-laws, let's say, for instance, that it was justifiable in terms of um, not wanting to be close to that kind of, of contention. Well, you have to remind yourself that the cleaving is with your wife. She is the priority. That's the sacred unit you now have to protect. Yeah, so Ephesians 5, let me just read this. We'll put it in context again. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one, one flesh. One flesh. Yeah, and, and that's Paul describes that as, that as this great mystery uh, that they become one, but he's talking about Christ in you. So we've got this this vertical relationship of us in Christ becoming one with Christ and being that bride of Christ, if you will, and then this horizontal union of the husband and the wife becoming one as well. And that's the context of Ephesians 5. Well, I think the concept of cleaving here is that you no longer are dependent on mom and dad to solve your problems. You no longer need to run to mom to say, you know, I don't like it when he eats bacon the way he just gulfs it down, (laughs) you know. And then mom says, well, you need to tell him that and get on his case. You want to create problems in families? Do that. Where if the spouse learns how to talk the language of the other spouse— and it is learning their language that's part of it. That's where the unity comes from. But when you are trying to do it outside of the marriage and you're doing it with in-laws, and I've seen more in-law issues than I can tell you about in marriages, and they all go back to one simple thing. Who's going to have the final word? And if the spouse is looking to mom and dad having the final word, hmm. that's not going to be a good marriage. They've got to make that final word together. All right, we're going to take a little break. Let me know what questions you have for the Guide Talk panel, 877-933-2484. Again, 877-933-2484. We'll be right back. It's the Afternoon Show with Bill Arno. Drive time, drive time. Let's get it started. Jump in your car. Yeah. What's for dinner? Yeah. It's the Afternoon Show with Bill Arno. It is the Afternoon Show, and it's time for Guy Talk, or Guys Who Talk. I've got Greg B., Tom P., and Jeff V. right here in the studio. So any questions you have, we will do our very best to answer them. All right, here's a question. Are the prophecies about the Israelites and end times related to location, physical descendants of Jacob, or religious beliefs and practices? Now, this is a multi-question piece here, so let's just take them one at a time. It is. It's timely, too, in the sense that there are the world's eyes are on Israel right now, and whether or not they have a God-given right to the land that they are in, or are they occupiers of this state of Palestine? So this is a a complex issue, but in a lot of ways, it's very simple. Abraham received a promise from God. It was an unconditional promise that you and your descendants after you would possess this land forever, the land of Canaan. That promise passed to Isaac. That promise passed to Jacob— And Jacob then became Israel and his 12 sons of the 12 tribes of Israel. So God has given the land of Israel to the descendants of Jacob, and he says that they would dwell in that land forever. So not only does Israel have a God-given right to the land that they are in, they also have a world a stamp of approval. The UN uh, made them a state on May 14, 1948, and they have rights to be in, in that land today. Um, the part of this question also goes, okay, is, are we talking about the modern state of Israel 
or are we talking about the descendants of Jacob? And clearly, biblically, we're talking about the descendants of Jacob. We don't, as a church, we should support Israel. Genesis 12, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. That's still true today. God has not rejected Israel. Romans 11, actually Romans 3 and Romans 11 makes this perfectly clear. Has God rejected his people Israel because they are in disbelief? By no means. His gift and his calls are irrevocable. And let me read one last verse because Israel still is in unbelief today. There's only about 40,000 born-again Jews in Israel. Now, in the United States, there's as many Jews in the United States as there are in Israel. There are about 7 million Jews in the United States. And um, I have heard that there's upwards of close to a million born-again Jews in America. And the number is growing dramatically today. Uh, I think it's a sign of the, the times that we're in. But he's regathered Israel back to their land, not in faith, not in belief yet. The dry bones are being assembled, but life hasn't come into them them yet. They will one day, I think at the second coming. But he says this, and God says this in Ezekiel 36, I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord, when I prove the, um, when I prove, this is not the verse I was looking for, that I will take, oh here, I will take you out of the nations and I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back to your own land. God has promised it, not because they are faithful, but for his namesake, rest of verse 22, for the sake of my holy name, he says. That's why he's doing it, because he made a promise to Abraham and God is good on his promises. You know, this is one of the most confusing concepts in the Bible because I've been accused of replacement theology. I said exactly what you guys are saying, because I didn't say the current state and political situation in Israel means that we must protect them and give them every weapon under the sun because they're God's chosen people. Well, the Bible talks about descendants of Abraham, and it talks about, what does Paul say? The church is grafted in to that line. So the church becomes part of the descendants of Abraham in that sense. And so when we're talking about uh, Israel, technically— you can play, you can talk about the descendants of Abraham, which is exactly what it is, and the church is now part of that, so technically they're part of Israel, however we want to define that in the end. The wild branches grafted yes. in. Yes. yes, and the Bible talks about that, but I see so much division on this in Christianity that it bothers me because we don't have unity on how we should approach this, and that's why we have people, some who go to Israel and witness, and some who don't believe we should witness to them. And I have friends that are of other denominations that tell me it is wrong of me to try to win a Jew to Jesus because, after all, they have their own salvation. Now, that's crazy. Everybody needs Jesus in the end. Yeah, let's let's name that, by the way. That's called dual covenant theology. Some teach this, that you don't have to witness to the Jews today uh, because there's a future plan that God has for Israel, and I, I don't think that's the case. Romans earlier makes it very clear that whether you're Jew or Gentile, you are both under sin, you are both dead in that sin, and you both need to believe and be saved, whether it's Jew or Gentile. So the gospel is for Jews, the gospel is for Gentiles today. Today is the day of salvation, whether you're Jew or Gentile. So I agree. Agreed. Yes. Yep. All right, I'll carry on with another question similar. Some people are obsessed with the established nation of Israel, but aren't the prophecies more related to the chosen people? Many Israelis aren't religiously Jewish, and many descendants don't live in Israel. Yeah, so that's exactly what we were just talking about in Ezekiel 38. Yes, they are unbelievers today. They are still being gathered in unbelief. And so, but God is doing this not Mm -hmm. because they have been faithful, but because God is faithful. It's for his namesake that he is gathering them Mm -hmm. back and will eventually save them, Romans 11 All Israel will be saved. And I think that's the day that Jesus returns when they look upon him whom they have pierced and they will mourn. They will finally recognize their Messiah and enter into the millennial kingdom. Now, but that's future. Today, right now, Jew or Gentile alike need to believe in order to be saved. And like I said, we we don't need to be apologists for the state of Israel, for the government. I mean, their government has issues just as our government has issues, just as every government has issues. But God 
has a special plan for Israel because his gift and his call, like Romans 11 says, are irrevocable. You know, it's interesting, First Peter 2, nine. you all know that verse, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may de- proclaim the excellencies who call you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Peter is writing to Christians, but he's showing that grafting in concept, and once you're grafted in in Jesus, there is no longer a division in that sense. But this is not well understood today. This is not well taught. And it is, for me, a concern because I want to support the descendants of Abraham, regardless of where they are, and part of that is the church. The church is a big part of that. But it's also those that ultimately come to faith in Jesus, and I want to support them as well. Whenever man chooses to govern, apart from a relationship with their creator, all we prove is that man is incapable of managing himself. Hmm. Yeah. And so when we talk about the nation of Israel, as I think you pointed out and made it more clear, who we're really talking about, and the Scripture is talking about, the descendants of Abraham, that that's what the focus is. It's not on the state of Israel. The state of Israel, like any other country, is led by men and women who have turned their back on God. And the policies and everything that flow from an unrepentant heart um, just proves again that man is incapable, apart from God, of managing himself. That's why we need a Savior. Yeah. So let's, let me read one more verse, Romans chapter 9, 6 and 7. It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descendant from Israel are Israel. Right. So this is what you were talking about, right. Pastor Tom, right? This is we have become true Israel, if you will, by faith in Jesus Christ. And by the way, Anybody who is a Jew by descendant, also the natural branches are true Israel through faith in Christ, right? Now, if you are in disbelief and you are a Jew, that is when God goes on to say here in Romans 9 that the natural branches are broken off. But he says this, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. That's the promise, the promised child of Isaac rather than man's efforts, if you remember the story with Ishmael and Abraham having Ishmael as opposed to the child of the promise, who was Isaac, um, we are all children of the promise, the promise of the coming Messiah. So it's by faith in Christ that we are saved today, just as we have all three declared here. All right. Uh, Greg B., I'm looking your direction right now. When a person leads another to Christ and the profession of faith is sincere, but much later stops believing... Does the one who led him or her to Christ lose the reward that's given to soul winners? Absolutely not. The idea is that we have a responsibility to others, but we cannot take responsibility for others. What they do with what they hear is between them and God. Mm -hmm. As long as I fulfilled my commitment to be responsible to them, to share the gospel, and let's say that they receive Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, but then later on deny him, that's not a fault of the presentation. It's the fact that they're taking responsibility for themselves, and they have to answer for themselves. I cannot answer for them. I'm responsible to them, but I am not responsible for them. It's interesting. I had mentioned this before. Early in my ministry, I was agonizing over salvation in people. I mean, I was up late at night trying to convince people to receive Jesus. You know, at 2 in the morning, I'd still be on the phone. Did with you them. call them at 2 in the morning? Or no, you know, I didn't. Okay, they called me, but we <laughs> worked it out from there. The point was, though, I really felt, I didn't hear a voice in that, but I really felt the Lord finally say, Tom, I'm the Savior. Stop it. Your responsibility is to give them invitations and opportunities to know mm-hmm. me. And once I did that, it made a whole difference in my life. And that's why even at my age, I still enjoy doing Christian ministry. I'm not tired of people because I, I understand who people are. They're just people that need the love of Jesus. Hmm. Kind of takes the pressure off, doesn't it? It does. Boy, it's a different world. Well, I mean, if, if you really grasp what I was sharing about a responsibility to them, when you fulfill your commitment to the Lord by being a testimony and by, as you're talking about, Tom, answering questions that they're really asking, and what they do with that information is their responsibility. Now, we have to be careful of what we declare. We've got to make sure it's scriptural. We have to make sure that that we're representing God honestly and and truthfully, and that we really are following and taking the initiative to communicate with people that may want to resist him. 
But that's fulfilling our response. I think God honors those who have fulfill their responsibility to others, but he doesn't hold them accountable for what they do with what they've heard. That individual that shared with them doesn't hold that person uh, accountable. Mm-hmm. And Tom, if you need me and you call me at 2 a.m., I promise, I promise you'll be able to get into my voicemail. Thank you very much. I'm feeling better about that. Oh, good. We'll take a little break, come back with lots more Guy Talk or Guys Who Talk. Let me know what questions you have for the panel, 877-933-2484. Again, 877-933-2484. Be right back. Forgiveness is always the destination, but it is often a journey to that destination. Text FORGIVE to 877-933-2484 and you'll receive a series of text messages featuring audio clips of interviews from Mornings with Carmen, Susie Larson Live, and Afternoons with Bill from past shows focused on forgiveness along with Bible verses and written prayers. Time for more guide talk or guys who talk. You ask questions, they'll do their best to answer them. 877-933-2484. Here's a question. When and over whom will we reign? When and over whom will we reign? Well, (laughs) we will inherit the earth. And we will reign over the earth, uh, Revelation 20 says, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That sounds really cool, by the way. Um, There are, we as the body of Christ, the church believers, will have received our glorified bodies and we will reign with Christ in our glorified bodies over the earth for a thousand years. Now, who's on the earth? It's people who believed, because you can't enter the kingdom of God without faith, and are in their earthly bodies or natural bodies, and that earth will be repopulated over the course of a thousand years, and that's the nations that we will reign over with Christ. I've already put my reservation in. I want to go ahead and rule over Ireland. (laughs) Ireland, the whole country? Yeah, the whole country. Love it. (laughs) Perfect. Wow. Wow. Right. We, We actually don't know... What that looks like? No, we don't. We know of one person and what his role is, and that is King David. It says that he will be prince over Israel during that time. Um, we don't really know what our role is going to be and what that looks like. So, All right, gentlemen, uh, well, who are the heavenly beings in Psalm 29, verse 1? Who are the heavenly beings in Psalm 29, verse 1? I, I think that phrase is used more than once in Scripture, and it it always refers to, at least my understanding, and Jeff, you you may correct me, but I I believe it's the angels. I I think so. I think that's what it means. We, You know, there's some lists of different spiritual beings, right? We got the cherubim, and they seem to be around the throne. We have angels, which are simply messengers. That's what that word means, messengers. So heavenly beings that come down and and give messages here on earth. And then we have demonic powers, but, uh, you know, the powers and principalities and authorities, I don't know how to classify all this. Look, I know this. There's a, a, for, a spiritual force for good, and there's a spiritual force for bad, and we are in a spiritual battle. And Paul declares it, and you know what I do when I, for my spiritual battle? I dress in God's armor and I fix my eyes on the commander of the armies of the heaven, and I let him worry about the details. Psalm 89.6 brings some clarification. I think this is the, the other places that I was referring to. It says, For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? Mm. All right, well done. My next question is this. Is self-care, like we see and hear about today, a biblical idea? I hear a lot of Christians talking about self-care these days. Well, it really depends on what you mean by self-care. Self-care can mean taking care of the temple of God, which you you have. You, you're the holy mm-hmm. temple of God. Making sure that you're not exposing yourself to uh, debilitating situations or drugs or anything else like that. So I, self-care like that, I think, is warranted. Totally agree. I have a friend who goes out and runs about 12 miles a day, a day. 
his wife doesn't like it because he's gone all day to work. She's got a bunch of kids. He comes home, doesn't want to eat supper, and goes out and runs for the next two and a half hours. And by the time he gets back, the kids are in bed, and she's tired, and she doesn't even want to talk to him. That's wrong. That's not self-care. There's something really wrong there. That's more, that's an obsession. If he wants to go out and run a mile or two, build his heart, that's one thing. But I think today in our media and in the on the Internet, so much of self-care is nothing but selfishness, where it's all mm-hmm. focused on us and what we can get, ignoring those that we love or that we are family. And we've got to focus on them as well. Self-care goes both directions. Good word. All right, here's a question. I don't know what to make of this one, but that's not the first time I've said that. Uh, I heard a theory that God is water. It fits with a lot of scripture and ways God is described. What are your thoughts? God is Great. water. This is your example of God yeah, being Trinity. water in the Trinity. Go through that and see if that's yeah. what they mean. All right. When we, t- when we think about the Trinity, we're talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as I shared in the past, I gave an illustration to a class I was teaching. I had a pitcher of water, and I had three different containers. And I looked at and I said in this picture, is this the same water? Does it have the same composition, chemical composition? And everybody in class says, yes. Then I poured it in each of the cups. I says, what's the difference? It's the same water. Well, it's the the cup there or the bowl or, or the urn that you put it in. And I said, that's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father is the author of life. Jesus Christ is the giver of life. And the Holy Spirit is the power of life. But it's all God. So in that, and we're talking about it metaphorically, about the water, because the Bible is also called the water. Mm-hmm. It cleanses us. Mm-hmm. And so it depends on which metaphor you're using. But if you're talking about, is he actually water? The answer would be no. Yeah, and any physical description or any metaphor that you're going to use to try to describe the Trinity, and there are many out there that people have tried to explain the Trinity in some way, is always going to fall short because we're talking about a, an eternal, immortal, omniscient, omnipresent God who has uh, revealed himself to mankind as Father, uh, Son, and Spirit. So uh, any physical picture, that that can be helpful for some people to try to understand the Trinity, but any picture is going to fall short. Well, your illustration about us being kind of a Trinity in the sense of, of body, soul, and spirit, and they each have different functions, mm-hmm. just like each member of the Trinity or each person of the Trinity has a different function, a different role, but it's all the same God. Yeah. Well, the Bible says that God is spirit, and in him there is no darkness at all. So the Bible gives us the definition of the Lord himself. Now that spirit became human in the Lord Jesus Christ and walked among us for 33 years. But that's the best definition I know. The only other time you really read about water and the Lord is in Genesis 1, where the spirit was hovering over the waters Mm -hmm. and he separated the waters. But the water has nothing to do with who the character of the Lord is or who he is. It just is water. Nicely done. I wonder if that question came as a result of that illustration, Greg, you gave a little while ago. Hmm. He might have done that last week, actually, or maybe two weeks ago. Yeah. Mm, Yeah. And if you um, have a question or a comment for Guy Talk, we are going to be full steam ahead into hour two, which is just around the corner. But you can text your question over right now to 877-933-2484. Again, 877-933-2484. Eight four. You know, true forgiveness brings healing, but it is also hard work, and it does take time. You can text the word forgive to 877-933-2484, and we'll text you audio messages, Bible verses, and more to encourage you on this journey. Again, simply text the word forgive to 877 877- Nine three three, two four, eight four, and if you uh, if you're new and you just started listening to Faith Radio, couldn't be any happier that you're doing that. And if you want to re- request a free welcome pack, you can uh, text the word welcome to that same number eight seven seven nine three three two four eight four. We'll be right back with Guy Talk. I've got Greg B, Tom P, and Jeff V as my panel. Text your questions over eight seven seven nine three three. 2484 Guy Talk Hour 2 
just ahead. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.